welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's me. Some people call me Jackie, some people call me Jax, some people call me Jacqueline, some people call me Jack A, some people call me <laughs> Shakwi. Wow. That's actually my favorite. Me too. I wish that my J-A-C-Q-U-I. name really was C Q U I. I know it's the best. <laughs> Jacqui. Oh, and hi, it's me, Diana. <laughs> you forgot. But wait, what do people call you? Diana or Di or Dinana. Dinana. That's usually to small children. <laughs> One time I called Diana Big Diana because we had a child, Diana, and Diana did not appreciate. When I call Not my fave. Big day. No. <laughs> I can see. Day. I can understand that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's just different, you know, different stimuli that equal me. No. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, while there are many stimuli that might equal an object, a corresponding object, which, spoiler, that is our topic for today, but that's, you know what? That's what happens. We're, we're recording at a different time. I'm confused. Okay, here we go. Well, while we do have multiple ways that we can say refer to each other, which may be relevant to our podcast, we probably should tell y'all what that podcast is about. And it's a podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, where every week we discuss a topic related to the field and relevant research articles. And this week, if you didn't guess it, is going to be all about multiple exemplars, multiple exemplars in our teaching procedures. So we've got a number of articles in which we will talk all about how multiple exemplars can or maybe can't be used in teaching procedures, making them more efficient, more streamlined, and faster. So, Diana, what articles are we going to be discussing today? Oh, well, let me tell you that, Rob. We have four articles that we will be reviewing today, and they are as follows. The Importance of Multiple Exemplar Instruction in the Establishment of Novel Verbal Behavior by LaFrance and Tarbox. That was published in Java 2019. Using multiple exemplar training to teach a generalized repertoire of sharing to children with autism by Marzullo Kurth, Reeve, Reeve, and Townsend. That was published in Java 2011. Using multiple exemplar training to teach empathy skills to children with autism. That's by Siva Raman and published in Behavior Analysis in Practice 2017. And finally, the effects of multiple exemplar instruction on the relation between listener and intraverbal categorization repertoires by Lichago, Carr, Kaisemore, and Gro, and that was in the Analysis of Verbal Behavior 2015. And that's it. Great. End of show. And if you listen to all of our episodes, you'll know that, that this is, is kind of coming to the end of our, our summer vacation episodes, at least in the sense of just vacations, us hanging out, recording together. So we might get a little silly on this one, or it might be a little tired, depending on what we're all busy doing. So please sit back and enjoy, because next month we got lots of guests, which, you know, we want to be very professional and, and not be uh, sipping Mai Tais on the beach. We got some us, too. Some no, there's always too, some. There's but... always some us. But, you know, the, I, I can't remember the last time we had a month where it was literally just... Just uh, us. Just us recording. It would have been like the first year of the podcast, probably. Yeah. It was a long time ago, for sure, yeah. We just needed to reconnect. I know. Just hang out. You know, it was a little loose, a little more loosey-goosey. Like, we just get to talk. What do you think about these articles? Just share our hot takes. So, this will be the last of the last of those three. So, we're, we're a little sad to lose some of that relaxation, just like at the end of summers. But we still got August. There's still summer vacation there. But, you know, you got to get back into your structures and your routines a little bit more. Well, why don't we get started talking about multiple exemplars? Now, this was a topic that we wanted to talk about, and unlike some of the others that you know we've done recently, were ones that either we were just super passionate about, or we've been reading research on it for our kind of day jobs. Multiple exemplar trainings. I don't remember how this one made it on the list. We just hadn't talked about it in a while, or I don't it even came remember up. Remember who put it on the list? Oh my goodness, Jackie, was it you? It was me. <laughs> oh, that's how I got on the list. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know a lot about it. That was oh, okay. my thing. I didn't know a lot about it. Somebody asked a question about it, and I was like, well, at the very basics, I know very basics, but I don't really know a lot around mm-hmm. this because, full disclosure, verbal behavior is not my forte. And so I wanted to learn a little more. Okay. And you don't need to use verbal behavior no, training just to do multiple no. exemplar no. instruction or training. So we have done some topics that kind of dance around some of these similar ideas. So I thought I'd just throw them out there initially in case people like this topic and want to learn more about ways in which you can work to promote generalization and plan for generalization. 
So quickly, those include episode 49, when we discuss matrix training with Dr. Cormac McManus, episode 73, in which we as a team discuss general case analysis with no one except ourselves, and then episode 143, in which we discuss stimulus equivalents. Mm. So those are not all the same thing, but they all touch on aspects of multiple exemplars and or generalization. So I thought I would just throw them out there as companion episodes for this one. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I, I thought we'd kind of done it all with the general case analysis and then a little bit more with stimulus equivalence, because as we'll talk about today, a lot of what goes into multiple exemplar training, note the emphasis, emphasis added by me, really does stem from trying to include a general case analysis. But these are a number of terms, as the LaFrance and Tarbox article that we'll start discussing will we'll say, really that get used as sort of one term. It's multiple exemplar training, multiple exemplar instruction, general case analysis, stimulus equivalence. I think there's an impression that they're kind of all sort of the same thing or they're modifications. No, not for any of you? So I don't think stimulus, stimulus equivalence doesn't fit in this for me. Well... Not in because the sense that they're not exactly the same. Class, right? That's true, but you could sort of throw them all in the hopper and like these all generally get at the idea of quick teaching using stuff, which I guess would you be may everything. You could be attempting to establish equivalence classes amongst right. similar exemplars. Yes. yes. That's how I can see that. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Mm, okay. Exactly. Well, with that being said, let's let's talk about where some of that confusion might come from. And and I think we'll start, even though it's one of the probably the latest article published was the LaFrance and Tarbox 2019 article, I think it does capture where some of that, whether it's confusion or attempt to kind of create a category that may or may not need to or want to exist, would be this article. So you know, we're we're coming at the idea of multiple exemplars as we all are or many of us are working with populations in which there is some learning disability, learning challenge, whether it's language, whether it's a slow pace of instruction. So a lot of our programming, especially when it comes to skill acquisition, is related to teaching as much as possible in the least amount of time required. We also are hoping that while we teach, we are promoting generativity and generalization, which again, are not the same things. Generativity really being that while we teach, our student is starting to demonstrate novel responses this could include, you know, stimulus and response generalization. It could include equivalence. It could include the emergence of untrained operands. That's the idea of generativity. But we also would like to see, does generalization occur at the same time? So again, if generativity occurs, there's a good chance generalization has also occurred. But we're talking about generalization. We're looking at, hey, when I trained a few responses occasioned by some sort of a stimulus, when I present different stim stimuli, whether it's stimulus variations or whether I'm looking at getting a slight variation in the overall response to topography, do those just sort of magically appear when my training is done? So I taught, in, you know, the basic example being I taught this picture of a dog and look, now my student knows every picture of a dog, as well as to things like, oh, I taught my student to say the word dog. And I also taught them to add, you know, an autoclitic frame. And now they're adding all these, you know, novel autoclitic frames to make really fun, different variety in sentences, right? And again, this is different than, say, equivalence, which would be, you know, demonstrations of different behavioral relations when you're training the other relations. So again, I taught A to C relation, and I taught A to B relations, and then, ba-bam, B to C relations appear in the individual's repertoire. And then, of course, emergence, we're usually talking about verbal operants. So, hey, there's some sort of a new response form in our stimulus conditions in which a new response form appeared. So, look, I taught a coex and I taught tax, and wow, mans appeared. I didn't teach those. How could that be? Now, again, it gets a little more complex because the, the operants are all functionally <laughs> functionally unrelated. In independent. They're functionally independent. Thank yeah. you. That's the word. They're mm -hmm. functionally independent. We shouldn't see that. However, we know we do because if you have children, you know you didn't teach your child every single possible operant for all the combinations of words. They sort of just learned them. And a lot of verbal behavior research is looking at, well, how could that be? Or why would that be? Or how can we promote that? So again, our goal is to wrap up all of these kind of <laughs> concepts in a little pretty bow and then put a teaching package that everyone can use that will maximize equivalence. It'll maximize emergence of new operants. It'll maximize generalization. It'll maximize generativity. And generativity really being our umbrella term to sort of encapsulate almost all of that. And if you wish you could read a whole paper on generalization and generality, then I would recommend Johnston 1979. Oh, it's so good. So good. It's real dense. Yeah. It's real like getting in the mud. 
Yeah, exactly. You need a coffee and like a cheesecake or yeah. a pie to get through that one. Yeah, you absolutely do. Yeah. Some waiters. <laughs> So there are lots of sort of theories and I'm not, I don't want to go into all of sort of the different theories about where, you know, where does language generativity come from? Because it'll require us talking about relational frame theory and bi-directional naming. Though, Jackie, you're going to have to talk about bi-directional naming because a little behind the scenes, uh, when I was, we're reading these articles, we usually divvy them up and whoever reads them first usually (laughs) divvies them up and I have more time off over the summer. So I sort of had read them all and I said, I know I'd rather take two articles to discuss than one that has a lot of bi-directional naming and naming of categories because, who oh boy, it's hard to parse. So I won't talk about that right now. I'll just <laughs> let you know. You'll be talking about it later. Heads up. <laughs> just a heads up. So, you know, we're not going to get into all of these. We're going to focus mostly on two terms that I thought were the same until we started doing this research, which are multiple exemplar training and multiple exemplar instruction. Now, both of those use the term multiple exemplar, which implies that there will be lots and lots of different examples of stimuli or responses being used. But we really have a difference in the two of them. And I, I, I feel like LaFrance and Tarbox's you know, article title should have been the difference between these two because they spend a lot of time talking about the differences. And then they sort of are like, and this is kind of what they are, but bidirectional naming, the end. I, I kind of think they, they lost what they were trying to talk about in, in writing this article. I bet that was a reviewer. Yeah, that was totally oh, a product reviewer. of reviewers, not them. Oh, yeah. no. Well, I, I mean, I, th- I thought they framed everything really nicely, and then the focus sort of felt like the title lied about what was, what was going to be in the article. <laughs> well, I was glad it did, because <laughs> the original title, it's like, I don't want to read about this. But when we get into a discussion about what's the difference between these two, what are examples of mm-hmm. MET versus MEI, I found it to be very fascinating stuff. So let's start with MET, because those are the articles that we're going to be discussing first. So multiple exemplar training... We're presenting different exemplars of the same stimulus. So, for example, I'm going to teach someone to tact dog when I show them a picture of dog. So I will use lots of different dog pictures until the responding of, oh, there's the picture of the dog, student says dog, becomes under the control of all of the stimuli in that class. So it doesn't matter the size or the shape or the color or whether the dog is looking up or down or turned around, whether there's a different background. they got the laser prom photo background. doesn't matter. (laughs) It's still a dog, right? That would be an example of multiple exemplar training. Yeah, no matter what. Or, hey, you know what? Look, I brought in a real dog, and the tact dog still applies. Or, hey, I drew my own picture of a dog. It's terrible. But you know it's a dog because it shares many of those same, you know, stimulus features, right? So when we teach or when learning occurs through multiple exemplar training, we are trying to sort of present as many of the relevant stimulus features of that concept in our exemplars so that no matter the, the, the setting, no matter the shape, the form, that novel responding will still occur. Novel responding in the form of doesn't, I don't need to train all of these. The word dog will appear or will, will not appear, will be spoken. Will appear, it will appear. <laughs> magically in the air. That would be a different operant if we're a comic book a word balloon that came out of your face. <laughs> that would be very different. I don't know if Skinner had a total description for that one. Say what? When we talk about novel, you know, the tact of that, you know, that dog tact example occurring across all these different examples, we're talking about stimulus generalization. If we are presenting lots and lots of different exemplars with, again, that constant target response topography, that's going to be a stimulus exemplar setup. If what we're looking for is the same SD every time with slightly different response topographies, so, you know, that's a dog, it's a doggy, look out dog, then that would be an example of at least a very basic response generalization. But you could use, you could get either response or stimulus generalization using multiple exemplar training. But the whether it's a response or a stimulus generalization you're looking for, your common thread is you have lots and lots of sufficient exemplars for that generalization to occur. So I'm just teaching all sorts of pictures and permutations of pictures of dog until the student, in, you know, given some novel probes, is able to tact dog. So you could change physical stimulus properties like objects versus pictures. You can have different behavior change agents like your teachers or your parents or other kids asking, you know, holding up pictures of dogs. You could change the environment. 
again, I, I do like this about the about the article. I, I hope LaFrance and Tarbox aren't, aren't mad at me for, for dissing some of, my, some of the general title theming, but some great exemplars of generalization of other responses. Because I think I always go to his dog pictures, but again, there's been generalization of problem-solving responses using toys, sort of showing examples of improvisation of some play responses, uh, vending machines using general case analysis, which we talked about in the episode on general case analysis. But basically just training an individual to use different machines that sort of captured all of the relevant components. We also talked about credit card machines, which is another one where you think credit card machines, right? Well, where do I put the credit card? In the top, in the bottom, on the side? Which button do I push? The green one or the one with the arrow? Maybe it's green with an arrow. Maybe it's yellow with an X and red with a circle. Yes. So lots of differences there. We reviewed that one in episode 73. Mm Mm-hmm. But you could also use multiple exemplar training for imitation skills, for man's conversation skills, vocational skills, and on and on. But the generativity always is going to stem from stimulus or response generalization. That's really all you're going to get from MET, which is important because there are lots and lots of stimuli (laughs) and lots and lots of responses. (laughs) But at the end of the day they kind of clump around some, some commonalities, right? So we want to use those. Now, multiple exemplar instruction, however, refers to a different procedure where you're rapidly and randomly rotating instructions that target different verbal operants. So you're mostly going to see MEI in teaching specific verbal operants. So across your consecutive trials, you're having these rapid rotation, rotating instructions. So it could be listener behavior in the form of like point two X or Y, point two picture of dog, speaker behavior, you know, tax, a coex, mans, all of that. And you're setting up the environment for appropriate antecedents and consequences to evoke the different verbal operants. So let's go back to our dog. So if you're doing multiple exemplar instruction, you are going to be, you know, having pictures of dog present and saying, fine dog. Then you're going to take out a picture of a dog to try to, you know, evoke the tact. Then you might say, say dog. Your student says dog. So that's your, you know, echoic operant. And then you'll sort of just have some like general, generalized condition reinforcement. Then maybe, hey, you set up a motivating operation for the student to want a dog. They have a stuffed dog, for example, or you bring in a dog and then, oh, the dog left. And hopefully the student will say dog is the manned for dog, and then the dog comes back, right? And you're interspersing all of these operands, probably not all of them at the exact same time, maybe you're picking two or three at most, and you're interspersing novel and mastered exemplars across the categories to teach, again, the same target across all of the different operands. So the function's going to differ based on your trial, and you just pretty much teach and teach until you present a probe that shows, look, look, I taught this one or these two operands and the untrained operand for that same form, up here. So again, you know, the basic example would be I taught listener responding to dog pictures and boom, student now can tact pictures of dogs. You could also combine your MEI with MET by having lots and lots of pictures of dogs and line drawings and dogs with different prom backgrounds. <laughs> so when we look at the MEI instruction, the focus is a little bit different, although sort of you're getting kind of the same result. So if you're not getting into the distinctions between the two, you're sort of getting the same thing. I'm like, look, I taught a few things and lots of other responses magically appeared. Hooray. With MEI, you're really focusing on that bidirectionality between speaker and listener repertoires, or you're using MEI to teach complex forms of generativity. So like in the article by Lachago and colleagues are talking about teaching categorization, which is much more complex than just talking about our four kind of common operands here. Because you're trying to sort of demonstrate or establish that there's an interdependence between these verbal operands, which again, while they are all functionally independent, we know that there must be some sort of an interdependence because how else would all, you know, would the average person learn all of these operands without that additional training? Um, so some examples of how this bidirectionality has been taught, teaching speaker behavior after teaching listener behavior and vice versa, sort of the most basic example of MEI out there. You could do visual-visual matches, selections, tax, then impure tax. So again, tax that have multiple controls, like a picture, and then you say, what is it? And basically, and in sort of this initial study, this is a greer Stofi et al. 2005 study, so as a quick summary, they had matching instructions for a set of stimuli. That was set one stimuli. Then they do these probes for all the other response types of that same set of stimuli. Then they did multiple exemplar instruction for set two stimuli. So they're kind of switching between the different uh, teacher trials for set two. Then they do post-MEI probes for all the untaught responses in the set one stimuli. 
And then they did matching instruction for the set three stimuli. And then they saw, okay, with all that training, did we see emergence probes of all the other response types in that last set? And again, what they found in that study with just matching training, they saw an increase in the ability of the students to respond to listener trials, which you know, you would kind of hope to see. When they did MEI training with one set of stimuli, they saw an increase in the accuracy of speaker trials. So they saw tax, multiply controlled tax emerging, and all the other response types for the other untrained stimuli. So again, by sort of combining these two, by switching between your speaker and listener repertoires, they were able to show untrained responses occurring or, or emergence of untrained operands occur. This has been used with students with language disabilities, typically developing children, young children, children with various... Re- you know, prerequisites to bidirectional naming, children with limited vocal verbal repertoires, and on and on. You don't see this with SEI. It took me forever to figure out what they meant when they're talking about SEI for a while. I was like, oh, single exemplar. Instru- <laughs> like, oh, why would you call yeah. it that? Isn't that just anything that's not multiple exemplar teaching or multiple exemplar instruction? I should say, you don't see this emergence when you do single exemplar instruction, only with the multiple exemplar instruction. So again, why might that be? Well, multiple exemplar instruction seems to teach some sort of functional interdependence between your speaker and listener repertoires, potentially leading to some sort of a, a cusp of bidirectional naming. So again, when you're looking at sort of basic operants, you do see you can train, you know, only a few exemplars and see emergence of other exemplars occur when these operants. However, there may be limitations to that. It's only it's mainly been studied with sort of the more kind of basic operants. Right. And it, you know, there's been research to suggest that it the operant class will expand, but it won't not necessarily generalize to other types of operands. Mm-hmm. Like if I teach manding, it's not automatically guaranteed that then tacting will emerge, yeah. right? Sometimes it does, yeah, right? Sometimes we see it in typical developing Sometimes. kids. But you shouldn't be like, this is what's going to happen, mm-hmm. and no. this is what life is like, right? Yeah. So it, they, there is research to say that these co- these operates are independent, meaning they don't just naturally generalize. Yeah. So, M- sure. so yeah. maybe MET is sort of the widening of the base. Or MEI seems to be the, yeah, like more likely to be kind of a verticality yeah. of the same skill. Right. So two different ways to use multiple exemplars. And while we haven't been going that long, why don't we take a break so we can just come back and knock all these discussion uh, articles out of the park. All right. So now that you know the difference between the two, let's come back and talk about some uses of MET and MEI. We'll be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. RegisCollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we're back talking about multiple exemplars in teaching. And when we left off, we dis- differentiated between multiple exemplar instruction and multiple exemplar teaching. And now we're going to talk about some relevant examples, exemplars uh, of our oh, own. No. But before we do that, I want to remind our listeners that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to the show, you're able to earn one learning credit. Hooray! All you need to do is finish listening, then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash getceus, that's G-E-T hyphen C-E-U-S. You'll be able to find places to click to find the exact episode. There's too many of them to fit on one page at this point. Or you can check the show notes for this episode to find a direct link to the page. I recommend that one. It's the easiest way to do it. 
But you're going to need more than just good navigation skills. You're going to need two secret code words. I'm going to give you the first one of those now and then the second one later in the episode. The first one is Yogi. Y-O-G-I. Yogi. Whether it's someone who will teach you yoga or mindfulness or breathing, or whether you're referring to the stupid show with Yogi Bear Yo-Yogi from the 80s. Hey, boo-boo. There's eight limbs of yoga. There's eight limbs of yoga? Yeah. What's a limb? It's not just the physical practice. Oh, I said the I said the mindfulness. That's a okay, mind. Good. I got two of them. I got two of them. And what diet? We're not talking about that. Hot rocks? I don't know. I, I did oh, yoga once and did rocks. not <laughs> did not enjoy it. <laughs> Yogi. Okay. All right. So now it's my turn, and I'm going to talk about the Marzullo Kurth article in which they applied multiple exemplar training to teaching sharing for autistic children. So they let us off by saying there are a whole variety of pro-social behaviors that might be ultimately beneficial to one in order to participate in, you know, general education settings. And one of those pro-social behaviors is sharing. They listed specifically that this might be helpful for young children and that it creates opportunities for additional social interactions and participation in the classroom. So because... Any of these types of pro-social behaviors should ultimately be occurring in a generalized setting. That piece of evaluating how we're going to approach and specifically train for generalization should really be foremost of mind when you're approaching teaching a skill like this. So that's why they wanted to use multiple exemplar training in order to do this. And the Reeves are two of the authors on this study, and they have lots of different studies that look at multiple exemplar training. Rob touched on some of them. Several that look at play, joint attention, that credit card usage one that we already talked about. I love that in one. In episode 73. But for this study, the most recent research that they wanted to replicate and extend was DeQuinzio, Townsend, and Polson from 2008. And in that study, they taught a sharing sequence of teaching a child how to approach a peer, show them a toy, give them a toy, and then play with that toy together. And they did this across multiple toy exemplars. In the current study, they said, that was all great. Not to discount that, but what if we expanded that to include other classes of stimuli that also might you might need to share in addition to toys? So they wanted to expand this study to look at art materials, snacks, clearly this was pre-COVID, and gym materials. And they wanted to do this using multiple exemplar training. So there were four participants. They were all age seven to eight. They were all boys. They all had a diagnosis of being on the spectrum and they could all imitate verbally. This was conducted at school in a room separate from the classroom, like a little office, and they used the kitchen for generalization. And like I said, they had four stimulus categories. And within each of these categories, there were five different stimulus sets of materials. So we had art materials, and that included crayons, dot stampers, markers, colored pencils, and glitter pens. We had snacks. That included things like pretzels and marshmallows, except for one of the boys, Isaac, who liked those things too much that when they were removed, he was upset. So he used apples and raisins. I feel that. I know. I feel that, too. They had toys, and those included lots of good toys for sharing, such as Legos, cars, magnet tiles, Play-Doh, and a pegboard. And then finally, they had gym materials, and that included the game Scatch. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Where you have like the tennis, the fuzzy tennis ball, and then the the mitt. Oh. That was. they Sticky Catch. Yeah. I have it. We called it Scatch. I I never, I never called it that. I never, I've never heard of it that way. I was. I just called it the. You want me to catch with a fuzzy ball? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. For me, it was we called it Sketch. Maybe it was a regional thing. I guess, because it's anyway. a sticky, sticky catch. Yeah. Dinah's from, Dine is from the Cockney of the London product. of the 1800s, so, you know, she's always shortening words and everything. <laughs> you know it. Rhyme games. <laughs> so they had that thing. They had basketball, scooters, hippity hop, and Velcro darts. They make sure they noted that they were Velcro Or darts. varts, as we like to call yeah, them when I was a kid. Varts. <laughs> so there were five possible exemplars within each of those categories. And then they made video models of how to do this play behavior. In the video model, a boy was playing with the materials. A second boy approached. The first boy looked up, held out the item, and said some version of sharing, such as, do you want to try? And they made six of these different videos that they used across the participants. The main thing that we were measuring here was independent sharing. 
They had to do this with both the motor and the vocal part of the response. So holding out the item and saying some version, basically any version of, do you want to try this? So like if the video said, do you want to try? And the participant said, try, that counted. They were very, very accepting of all types of variations, which I think was appropriate. They took IOA. It looked good. The design of the study was a concurrent multiple baseline across participants which I thought was interesting. I was like going into it thinking this was going to be across the stimulus. Mm-hmm. That sets. would make sense. Mm-hmm. But they collapsed those data together. I wonder if they didn't actually get because they talked about how they got some within class generalization and some across class generalization. So if you were to set it up by stimulus sets and you get across class generalization, you've um, yeah. ruined your MBL. Mm-hmm. So I think that may be what <laughs> happened yeah. here. That which, makes sense. In the realm of teaching kids things is a good thing. In the realm of demonstrating experimental control, it's not a good thing. It does feel like multiple exemplar research is sort of to trying to do it, you know, do itself with the uh, you know one hand tied behind its back. It's like yeah. you can either teach really mm-hmm. well or get published, but it's really yeah. hard to do both. Yes, so they did it across participants, which probably was a good idea. And like I remember how there were those four classes of stimuli, so they used three of those for training, and the fourth one was reserved for generalization. Within each of the three classes that were for training, three of the stimuli were used in the videos, and the fourth was used for within-class generalization, and then the fifth one was used for the generalization across categories. All right? So they there's a lot of planning that has to go into this type of multiple exemplar training. This study lays it out really nicely and is a good model if you are interested in doing MET in this format with some other set of stimuli. So it's really useful for that. They, they do a really nice job. So the procedure was each session contained some baseline probes and some treatment probes, There were 18 total probes per session. Nine were baseline probes with three probes across the three categories with three exemplars for for probing. And then four trials were probes with the fourth exemplar from the three training categories and the fourth generalization category. And then, and this is also very important, they added in five non-sharing discrimination trials in there too where they gave the participants like some papers and they said, hey, will you go throw these away? So that they could test to see if they just offered to share every single thing, right? Because that's not always what you do. So that those were included as well. And then how those trials were ordered within each session was randomized. In the baseline sessions or probes, they the participant was given materials and the experimenter approach to see if they offered to share. They, they had a token schedule that was going throughout all of these sessions. So in, as long as they sort of stayed and participated, they could receive tokens on a VR2 schedule and trade those in later. If they did both the motor and the vocal response during baseline, the experimenter responded as though it were correct. But if they only did one portion of it, it was counted as incorrect. And then the training started out the same as baseline. Experimenter approached. If sharing occurred, the experimenter said thanks, took the item, and then they were like, okay, now we're done playing. But if they didn't share, then they did the following. They removed the items, and they presented a video model. The video was not always of the same materials as were in the session. And like I said before, the vocal response on the part of the child in the video changed. They had like six different ones. Then they represented the materials. If they then shared, they got a token. That was like the reinforcement system. If they didn't share, then the experimenter used some type of physical prompting and a vocal recording of the vocal prompt as needed. So if That's they did, cool. Mm. Yeah. I think it was just like to keep it standardized. Mm-hmm. They did one piece of it, then they only provided prompting for the piece they didn't do. And please note, they repeated that until the participant did it independently. Mm. All right. So that is not to be overlooked, right? Because that is like a pretty extensive error correction procedure that mm. they performed. And then, remember, there were those non-sharing trials. So in those, they were given neutral materials and asked to put these books away. Or can you wipe the table or something like that? And if they tried to share the items, that was incorrect. And they were redirected to just finish the task. The mastery criteria was eight out of nine correct for four consecutive sessions. Wow. So this is, yes. That's serious. These studies are so thorough. Any of these Sharon Reeve studies are definitely worth taking a look at. And initially, they received a token on an FR1 schedule that was thin to an FR2 schedule to an FR5 schedule. And then they did the post-treatment generalization probes. 
These were also done pre-treatment, but I didn't tell you that until now. They were done in the kitchen, which was the novel setting. And they had novel materials and novel people, specifically another peer, also diagnosed with autism. And they did all that. And then they also did maintenance at one, two, and five weeks. Very serious, right? Very thorough. The results, no one shared during baseline. Everyone learned how to share. Yay! (laughs) And when not to share. (laughs) And when not to share, exactly. That's important. Yeah. So they did note that they saw higher increases once they started training within category rather than across category generalization, but they did not give us the full breakdown of what those look like in their graph, the across category generalization. It, It was all collapsed together. So we just were looking at independent sharing for each participant. They did note that, you know, they provided those six different vocal sharing examples, and they got some generalization from those responses across all participants. So everyone did not just use the same response every single time. And then while everyone learned, some participants' data were more variable. So Aiden's data was more variable. Isaac had more sharing in the non-sharing trial, so that discrimination appeared to be more difficult for him. And only three participants did we get the maintenance data, not to knock the study. Like I said, very thorough. But they didn't collect that for Aiden, which is a little bit too bad because his data were the ones that were more variable to start with. But he just happened to be the last panel, you know, to start treatment. For Stephen and Bobby, the maintenance data looked very good. For Isaac, it was a little bit more variable. But again, he had a little bit of a harder time with discrimination overall. But the fact that they got this across these different stimulus sets to a novel setting with peers and then a large amount of maintenance is quite impressive. I know for me when I read this, I I felt like a lot of the additional prompts seemed, I don't want to say they were extraneous because we we didn't look in the study as to whether they were a required component of the treatment, but like the way they used the video models and the way they used the recording, it felt like a lot. Well, you just don't know because yeah. they're providing the video model. And then if that wasn't effective as a initial prompt, stimulus prompt, then they went in and prompted their response. So we don't actually know which of those two pieces was more important in establishing the behavior. Mm-hmm. I love or video both. modeling. Yeah, it could. Right. Yeah, it was or a both. combination right. of both. Yeah. But so I love video modeling. But component analysis. That becomes such a and you're going to have to make six videos for all of these 30s eight or whatever combinations of toys and sharing. And it's like, mm, no, we're not going to do that. It sounds like we'll they just didn't make them for all. No, they just made it. Yeah, but, just... but they made enough. They made enough of them with the different kids that it was, it's still the video model creation always feels like a limiting factor of this is going to get nixed. It's like, we don't have the resources or time to create all of these videos well, in a lot of settings. So if it's needed, it's needed. But if it's not really needed, that would be interesting to know. Right. I think that it'll cut down the, the time discussions on efficiency of video modeling are always interesting because people say, oh, well, once you have the video, then you can use it again and again with mm. different, you know, different students. But the, the front end of creating the video can be quite time consuming. Mm-hmm. So how do you determine how much time is actually involved in video modeling is a little bit up for debate. Yeah. But whatever they did as a package, it was quite effective for these students in a novel setting. They did not test it in like the classroom setting, which would have been another additional nice piece to have. Okay. Cool. Well, for another example of multiple exemplar training, we talked about sharing things. But what about sharing our feelings? Can we teach that? I don't know. Open up your mind files, folks. Let's let's see. So we're going to be talking about Siva Raman's 2017 article, which I think in terms of capturing every component of relevant methodology is not as thorough as the Reeve study. However, I thought the way Sivaraman laid out the multiple exemplars made kind of more sense. So I think it's good we're having both of these because I think this one captures the idea of what goes into coming up with your table Mm, of multiple exemplars very succinctly, even though the procedures are not as thorough and lead to a number of limitations, many of which were kind of responded to in, you know, in the study you just discussed, Diana. So although it came first, (laughs) although it came first, you know, I don't know. We're talking about feelings really complicated, really hard, you know, Mm -hmm. give it, give it, give it some space to breathe. 
So we're going to be talking hard. about empathy skills here. And empathy skills are, again, one of the social skills that are often considered to be deficient or do not occur as often with individuals with disabilities, most commonly autistics. And uh, People might disagree with that. In terms of? I think it may be that there are different ways. other ways to display empathy rather than what we sort of think of as the normative display of empathy. Yeah. Yes, I think that is more what I yeah. meant to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you did. But it is something that is, is, is noted by individuals who are scoring based on nor- some sort of a normative or neurotypical reference. So ap- ap- apologies in terms of not being as precise. When we talk about empathy, you know, we've talked about it in other episodes before. It's just this idea of taking another person's perspective. The quote from the article is, experience a congruent emotional state. But basically, it's noticing that someone else is engaged in outward behaviors that define, you know, some category of emotion, and then responding in a way that demonstrates you understand what emotion is being demonstrated, and you are providing some sort of you know, appropriate response, some sort of pro-social response, whether it's saying it's okay, offering to help, offering to share, whatever the response would be. It's going to be contextual to the emotion. And again, empathy is kind of noted as one of those pro-social behaviors that if it doesn't happen, it's going to be really hard to teach sharing. Well, we can teach sharing without (laughs) without empathy. (laughs) Helping or soothing. Again, I think it's less that you couldn't teach those, more as how well will it generalize to new settings and new situations without additional training. Yeah. So really what Sivarama was looking at is, okay, let's look at empathy as an observed response where some stimulus occurs in which someone's exhibiting an emotional response and the individual provides some sort of comment or action. What was interesting in this article was how Sivaraman looked at empathetic responses or the stimuli that would occasion an empathetic response as having kind of multiple components to it. You know, I think most people think of empathy as it's like, oh, I'm mind reading. I know what's in your brain. It's a sadness feeling or a happiness feeling. Whereas where Sivaraman is describing empathetic responses, we're really looking at, well, there's a discriminative stimulus that is going to have kind of a vocal component, an effective component in the sense of, you know, facial expression, and then potentially a motor component as well. You know, when you say, ah, and you grab your arm, you you know, the empathetic response is, ah, pain, and you respond, can I help you, or what can I do, do you need assistance, you know, as, as an example here. And this isn't the first article to look at, can we teach autistic individuals empathetic responses in different scenarios, but Siva Raman sees this as a good way to use multiple exemplar training to capture all of the potential stimuli that could be noted in an empathetic response SD. So let's use them all and train (laughs) in multiple settings and people using prompting and reinforcement. I love that. Yeah. So the the treatment itself, not super complicated. What is complicated, however, are the empathetic sort of tables that need to be created in order to provide this training. So we have our two participants, the children with an ASD diagnosis. They're able to repeat multiple word phrases. They can follow instructions. They already knew how to ID emotions from narrated situations, that's which good. is important. Yeah, that's helpful. Well, it's potentially important. Actually, right. not sure. They could man for items. They can man for information. They could hold short conversations, but they were rated by their caregivers as showing no appropriate empathy. All these trainings occurred in a small room or hallway. They had lots of different toys and items. And they looked at the emotions of sadness or pain, happiness, and frustration. But within those three emotions, there were four different stimulus categories. And within each of those stimulus categories, there were five different events. So I'm going to give some examples because I think just saying those words probably sounds like a lot of stuff. No idea what it looked like. So let's talk about, say, for example, the frustration category. So frustration is our emotion. Inside that kind of category, there were four stimulus categories, one in which the individual was searching for objects, and that's, that's the, uh, the therapist or the um, researcher, one in which they were having difficulty fixing an object, one in which they kept dropping objects, one in which they were carrying a heavy object. So those are our four stimulus categories of frustration. So those are four frustrating situations you might encounter in a day. They with are. The, they are. They, yeah. they, they really captured it. Yeah. And then with each of those categories, there were also multiple stimulus sets. So, you know, they were searching for puzzles or a board game or a bowling ball or a bowling pin or crayons, or they were carrying heavy bowling ball. You know, there were all sorts of different items that were sort of used to make up those categories. And they chose the items. I think this is similar to, to 
the Reeves study, they chose the items from doing observations with typically developing and autistic children to say, okay, what are the things that typically the students were saying or the children were saying, you know, in, in these types of situations. So they tried to make them as naturally occurring as possible. And then each exemplar, when it was presented to the participant, consisted of a nonverbal movement or motion, a verbal statement, and an effective SD. So I'm searching for a puzzle piece. You can clearly see me moving my hand inside a bag, moving my hand back and forth. I make the verbal SD, ah, oh, like, oh, oops, or something. Or I can't find the whatever. I can't find the puzzle piece. Where's that puzzle piece? And then I'm making frowny faces. I'm, I'm sighing. I'm shaking my head back and forth. So all three of these would be used to make up the frustrating category trial, for example. Sadness had similar categories. Fall down, I feel sick, I'm hurt while using a tool, I'm sad about something that got broken, and again, multiple exemplars within those. So the empathetic response being scored was some sort of a contextually appropriate response that, and this is a quote, that involving a vocal component or sometimes a motor component within three seconds of the emotional display yeah. by a person. And they'd have two different responses for each one. They were pretty consistent across the categories by design. So do you need help or can I help you? We're pretty much the only two for the frustration conditions. But there was the motor component. They'd actually help search for the item. So similar to the sharing examples. For hurt, hey, are you okay? Are you all right? And for happiness, wow, that's so cool. Or that's cool. The less cool, that's cool versus the wow. The wow really sells it. I think so, too. And those were the only two responses taught per category. So there weren't exemplars of different empathetic responses beyond those two. And there was actually a reason why there wasn't a physical component in each of these, because that was my first statement of like, well, frustration, they're looking for a thing. Shouldn't sad they go put mm -hmm. their hand on their mm -hmm. shoulder or pat them on the head or something? And it was considered a, a cultural variable. Not all students are going to be from cultures where physical response to emotionality is considered appropriate. So let's not teach it. You can always add it in smart. later, but yeah. let's keep it out for now. Whereas frustration, I think that was one where we'll, people help people find things. It's, you know, it's hard to do that without actually you know, physically having the emotive response. So our procedure, again, pretty simple. The instructor would just sort of start engaging in a lot of activities with the child in a naturalistic fashion. And then during those ongoing activities would sort of just start showing <laughs> it was a happiness trial. So oh, I'm smiling and I'm holding a thing up or I'm frustrating. Oh, I'm looking at my bag for the thing I can't find and making but noises and frowning. Funny if the kid was like, wow, this like internally, right? Having some covert <laughs> behavior being yeah. like, wow, this person is really extreming, right? Yeah. Like right. all <laughs> the way. Today. Yeah, you, you, you're the experiment. You really look like a, a, a day, mess during right? this playtime. It's like you're happy, you're sad, you're frustrated. Whoa. I mean, take a Hurting breath. Yourself. Slow down. <laughs> and then when they, you know, then there'd be like a play. There'd be these ongoing activities like arts and crafts type activities. Then there'd be a free play time where that would be where sadness would occur, right? And you would just, you know, the experiment would just present each event's SD and did correct responding occur? If so, thank you, I'm okay, was the response. That was baseline. Otherwise, nothing. The kids would get praise and toys just for sitting and waiting, like you'd expect in a baseline. In the treatment itself, they had behavior-specific praise for the correct responses and access to preferred toys for engaging in the correct empathetic response. Incorrect responses, nothing happened. So they chose 16 stimuli of the 20 total possible for each category in the training. They'd randomly have an exemplar from the subcategory to serve as a probe. And they'd pretty much just run 10 training tiles within their, their general play session and four probe trials, randomly ordered. And they do it across two people in two settings. So I kind of imagine this is just being like it's a long play session and they're just occasionally getting mad and getting happy and getting sad. Yeah. Participants who weren't showing the empathetic response, they used a pretty simple verbal prompt, prompt delay sequence, and manual prompts for that frustration trial. We had to help them search for the item or help them carry the item. And that just sort of followed a, a time delay after each session in which, you know, you had about 40% correct responses. And then they did a follow-up. So that was it. So again, not a lot in terms of the teaching. It was more the setup that really took the time. And looking at the results with the delayed multiple baseline design across the different response categories, we saw mostly what you'd expect. Low levels of empathetic responding for both the participants in baseline, introduction of treatment, and increased responding in the instruction trials. Also, the probe trials, which is the key part here, because if you're going to do all this setup and you don't get any <laughs> novel responding in probes, that's a lot of work when you probably could have just taught each one separately, maybe faster. I don't know. You know, we, we don't know about the efficiency of that. 
One of the participants was at 100% in sadness and frustration. Happiness was a little harder, I think. They didn't really explain why. So only like 75% uh, of trials showed a response, empathetic response to happiness. But they did see maintenance to responding across all three categories. So responding to sadness and frustration was somehow either easier or clearer in this setup than the uh, happiness condition. Well, I think that there is probably a stronger EO there, Mm -hmm. right? To end the aversive event of having someone else be in distress versus just sharing in someone else's happiness. Like, you can sort of do that without saying anything, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to me, they're stronger EOs, probably. Again, like we talked about some limitations, they didn't intersperse with non-empathetic responding, so they weren't testing to see was empathetic responding just occurring all the time. Wow, that's cool, all the time, without having uh, those situations. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot. Well, you know, the experimenter is giving them a lot, so you, know, you got to keep up in those, in those play trials. They didn't do a social validity test. Specifically, they didn't look at, hey, did anyone else feel that these children were responding in what would be considered kind of a traditional empathetic response at all? Was it considered similar to neurotypical over peers? They never ran any of these with peers, and they only used two adults across the whole experiment, so we'll get no probes in the natural environment. They also were looking at training each category to mastery. Then they'd start training the new category. So could there have been some overlap and still see responding? Would have been interesting to know. Could you have sped this process up? Because it's an important skill, but again, efficiency can be key. So, you know, again, also, would this maintain in the natural environment rather than this environment where, like, you were so nice to help me have some toys and very specific praise in the natural environment where you might offer to help someone and they yell at you or you you tell them, you know, I'm sorry, you feel sad and they just give you a nasty look or they tell you get away from them. Is this responding going to maintain in the natural environment? So we know we can teach empathetic responding to students who are labeled as not showing empathy, but does it generalize to other settings beyond the two in the testing? Does it maintain over time? A lot of questions to ask there. But you can teach a few situations with not multiple exemplar training and have the empathetic response generalize at least to different stimuli. And that's multiple exemplar training. So to wrap up, we're going to get into the more complex, at least in the context of the study we're reviewing, more complex multiple exemplar instruction. So Jackie, thank you for taking this conversation because I got confused just in the different categories being presented in this study. I think I think seeing it would be a lot easier than reading it. I want yeah, I want a movie of this study. It, I would get it. I know it, I get actually, it. Cuz I kept like I like wrote it down. I had to like make my own little thing and seeing it makes sense because it's all the things you already do Mm -hmm. right but just writing it down is complicated you know i'm not as fluent in say verbal behavior research so when i see a lot of the terminology you know used precisely especially when you're sort of lumping it into the idea of categorization right i almost every time i start reading a sentence i'm like wait i gotta go back and remember what exactly are they doing get a picture in my mind of what that trial looks like and then I get lost because I'm, I'm trying to do that for like seven or eight yeah. <laughs> different combinations. Yeah. So the nice thing about this article is that they are very thorough. They have a flow chart that helps you walk through what they're doing. Mm-hmm. They have a table that shows you all of the different categories, right? So that you can figure it out what the multiple exemplars actually are. They have the sets outlined. So they have everything that you would possibly need in order to replicate this. I think it's just weeding through what they did is a little bit challenging, but not because the procedures are challenging. No, right? it, just, there's a lot in there's there. Just a lot. There's so much being yeah. presented. And with the multiple exemplar instruction, it's being presented, and then you're switching to another example. You have multiple sets of stimuli. Yeah. It's just a lot to sort of try to... Pull through. So the reason that they wanted to use multiple exemplar instruction is that, that it might help pro- promote generativity across verbal operands. So they're specifically looking at across listener and speaker behavior. And so one form of multiple exemplar instruction is what they're using, and it alternates instruction between two or more response functions, such as alternating between a tact and a man in training trials, right? So here, they wanted to use that and see if they could promote generalization across categorization skills, because that's a much more complex repertoire, right? Mm -hmm. And it's difficult for some learners to learn, and then you typically don't see emergent responding there. So they were like, maybe we could use this multiple exemplar instruction. Kudos to kudos to Sarah for saying, you know what, for my dissertation, I'm going to go from the basic early research on MEI, I'm going to go from zero to 60. And just yeah. like, what's the most complex thing that could zero possibly be taught using this? Yeah. I'm just going to go for it. And, you know, to 
There was previous research here that suggested that training listener categorization first did not result in in emergent interverbal categorization, Mm -hmm. right? So they're like building on previous research that showed a null result, which I'm so surprised that that was published, right? Because usually it's not. When you get right, zero and not results. that that's not important, no, but you never important. see it published because there's a bias towards right. Yeah. So here they're looking at the effects of multiple exemplar instruction on emergent responding between interverbal and listener categorization repertoires. Right. So they're looking to see whether interverbals emerge following listener categorization training using multiple exemplars. So that's kind of like. In other words, because I think sometimes that's Mm -hmm. hard when you're using all of these words. (laughs) There's a lot. So they had six typical developing children. They ranged in age from late three to late four, right? So picture that in your mind. The study was conducted in their preschool classroom, either in a partition corner of the room or like right in the empty classroom. I like it was conducted one to two times per day. Or five and five to ten times per week. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. But as it's you notice, lot. they had a lot to do. Mm-hmm. So they know they told you that they used tokens and they reinforced appropriate behavior and correct responses on a VR three schedule. And at the end of the session, they could trade in for it seemed like a treasure box that was based on parent report. So that's good to know, right? That it's potentially reinforcing. And then they had all the visual stimuli in three ring binders. This, like, brought me back. Yeah, right. So they included novel and familiar stimuli. All the pictures were black and white. They had a tack training binder, and that contained all the pictures that were trained to tack. They had a listener training binder. They had a listener categorization training binder. They had an MEI binder. And they all contained, like, the sheets that they were going to be using to train. Right? So I just love that they had all these binders. Like, oh. (laughs) <laughs> this is what we're going to do today as they pick up the binder, right? So the dependent variable here was the untrained interverbal categorization response after initial listener categorization training before and after using multiple exemplar instruction. Yeah. But they also collected data during all the training sessions because they did a bunch of training sessions before they even got to the study. I think it's a helpful. I put this example in here and it's on page Seven, if you're looking at a PDF, it says, for example, after the participant was trained to point to the Japanese character Yoto in response to the instruction, which one is Japanese, a probe for the participant's untrained emission of the vocal response, Japanese, in response to the instruction, Yoto is, (laughs) right? And then you look. Expect and look. And then you put in. So that's, I thought that was very helpful because when you hear it, you're like, what? Yeah. So their examples were really helpful. So... In order for it to be considered correct, the response must have occurred within 10 seconds, and they looked for eight responses for tact and listener training and categorization training with familiar stimuli, 20 responses for listener categorization training with novel stimuli, and interverbal categorization probes, and 32 responses for that multiple exemplar instruction. Yep. They had really great IOA and PI. They had a little table. I love... IOA tables. You always bring up IOA and PI, yeah. Jackie. I do. And I love that they had procedural fidelity as a subheading mm. so that you could find it easily. I think that sometimes goes astray, like that might be cut off, but mm. we really need to know that you've done this right here because everything relies on the procedures in mm-hmm. this, right? If you accidentally reinforce something at a different time or you do run a procedure in a different error, like in a different way, the error might then be the reason why you don't see this emergent responding, right? So Mm -hmm. I loved that. They used a non-concurrent multiple probe design to look at the effects of MEI between interverbal and listener categories. So praise was contingent. I like to say enthusiastic praise. Was contingent on correct responses. The original draft and it was boring praise. Yeah, boring like, praise. Just <laughs> let's do that again. Great. The pilot didn't work out. So if an error occurred during motor responses, they used a gesture and a verbal prompt like, no, that's not it. Here's what it looks like. And if an error occurred during a vocal response, they just provided an echoic. And once the response was required under these training sessions, under conditions of reinforcement, they then tested it under extinction to make sure that the response was at strength. Right? It wasn't the reinforcement that... the was controlling the response, but just that the response occurred. So, once all that happened, that's like the general procedures, right? Mm-hmm. So they did the, an echoic assessment to make sure that students could respond to the prompts. It was an informal assessment. 
Then they did tech training. Here's the first one. So they taught the students to tech stimuli in sets one and two, as well as 24 stimuli in the multiple exemplar instruction. A, right? And then they wanted to make sure that that tacting repertoire was still strong, so they interspersed some maintenance trials in between to make that throughout the whole study to make sure that responding was strong, right? So here, TAC training was only mastered following 100% respondent under extinction conditions, right? So they did the reinforcement conditions, and then they did extinction conditions. Then they moved on to listener training, and they taught the participants to point to the stimuli in set one and two, and MEIA, which is that multiple and exemplar instruction, and that, again, had to be 100% under extinction. So they have a lovely flow chart where on the top they show those two things, TAC training novel exemplars, listener training novel exemplars. They show those two things. And then the next category is the interverbal listener categorization training. And they did this with familiar exemplars first to make sure that the students understood what was required of them, right? So there... The testing occurred at uh, the beginning of every session except for the multiple exemplar instruction. So two stimuli from four of the categories, which means eight, right? Eight stimuli were targeted. The categories were yes. animals. Two times four is <laughs> Can't eight. confirm. Hilariously that I had to put that in there because <laughs> I was like, how many? Eight. So animals, food, clothes, and toys, right? For the listener, they included pointing to the stimulus that went with the category such as which one is the animal, right? So they had... A correct and an incorrect responses and then that had to be 100% under extinction and then they moved to the interverbal categorization which would be like a cat is a mm. mm -hmm. and then they had to fill in the blanks and that had to be under 100% extinction before moving on to then the interverbal categorization pre MEI probe <laughs> so here's where we actually get into the multiple probe yeah. design right so here is the probe, and this is with novel exemplars. So it's going to be first with the first set, and then if they see it, then they move to the second set and or the third set, depending. This is where it gets a little bit dicey. So here, when they're in the listener training with novel stimuli, it's the same training as above, right, but with novel stimuli. And then after that was conducted... With one set, the interverbal categorization baseline probes were conducted to see if just by teaching that listener training can then you see interverbal conduction. So trials were randomly rotated to make sure that responses were under the verbal response and not just we always did listener first and then interverbal, right? They moved them around. Yeah. And then they did a multiple exemplar training or instruction with the set A. So blocks of four trials were presented, two trials of interverbal training, and then two trials of listener training. Yeah? Okay. Okay, then they did post-MEI probes for interverbal categorization for set one and two. Before they did that, though, they did the listener categorization. They assessed that for mastery, right? Because if they don't have that, then they have to go back. So they had to be 80% or higher. And then if they did have that, then they moved on to a new set, which was the listener categorization again, right? And if they didn't, they moved back. If they didn't do great there, they might have moved on to a different set. Or if they did great, they moved on to a different set. It depended, right? Mm -hmm. Both people did both. And that the MI, MEI with set B was conducted if set one or two was not at mastery. So then they just tried it with some other stimuli to see if maybe it was a stimuli. Kay. Phew! Okay. I think we did it. You're, you were right, Jagger. This this is the sort of thing that I feel like if you had a 30-second video, it would be like, oh, yeah, right. no, no, totally. Right. I, I get this. But you're trying to read it. You're like, wait, so this was the – this set came first. And then the MEI right. set, which in itself includes <laughs> multiple presentations of different right. you know, different yeah. cues. It's, it's a lot to just – read and take it's it. a lot to read the flow chart the flow chart is key mm -hmm. you can't do it especially at the end when you do get it and when you don't get it right if you do get it then you go to all the other p probes but if you don't get it then you go to meib right so yeah. it's confusing but i feel like it's not confusing if you see it mm -hmm. but to read it it's a little like mucky yeah but let's see what they got surprising results so tack training because this is typical developing kids, 
I was surprised that it took them up to 147 block trials yeah. to get mm-hmm. pack training. Yeah. I mean, they, they, were like li- they were little. They were little. Three so. or four, I know. And it's like Japan, their yeah, country. Yeah, they're, they're sort yes. of it's considered mm-hmm. arbitrary stimuli to, right. yeah, to them. Yeah, for sure. So that was surprising to me. Listener training after attack training, though, much quicker. Mm-hmm. Four to eight blocks. So that makes sense, right? So mm-hmm. we're seeing a, a little bit of acquisition there, one might say. Listener and interverbal categorization training with that familiar was two to five blocks. So good thing they put that in there, right? Because... Everyone needed at least two blocks in order to acquire that. And then when they did the listener categorization training with novel stimuli, they needed four to eight blocks per set. So everything needed to be trained. And then when they looked at MEI, they had 14 to 56 trials block, trial blocks per set in order for that to be mastered. So then they looked at baseline. It was lower than 50% for one participant, Doug, who defied all odds. I love Doug, who got like 40%. Everybody else got zero. I have never in a study, in like in a graph, ever seen so little bars. Yeah. Because there's like nothing there because it's zero responding. Mm. Yeah, right? There's just no bars. (laughs) Right? So Doug has the most responding. And then following MEI, he saw an increase with set one, but then variable responding with set two and three. Sophie got nothing. After post MEI training, but then when they moved on to a different set, she saw a little bit of increased responding, but really not much. Mm-hmm. Was set one, and then nothing was set three. Alex, nothing. Rick, absolutely nothing. So that was surprising, right? Mike, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Meredith, absolutely nothing. The graph is just lines. Mm-hmm. I would love it if a student turned this in to me as like a hypothetical. Look what happened. It's like, yeah. you didn't want to put any data in there, did you? So I was surprised really they didn't show anything, right? So it, what they said is that MEI did not produce reliable responding between listener and interverbal categorization relations. And it may not emerge because the relations were so complex, right? Yeah. You're using categorization. And they said that Doug probably engaged in some covert responding. Mm. So when they were asked to do a listener response, he was engaging in also, you know, that Mm. echoic response. But yeah, so that's a lot. And there's a lot of future research there that I think if you're interested in this, go into it and pick something. But this is like one of those waiting articles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But good. But murky. Yeah. All right. Well, we've covered covered these two. Yeah. These two types of multiple exemplar teaching, MET and MEI. Let's move into Dissemination Station and see what summary we can come up with. Oh, thank you. Now we're here in the Dissemination Station. And, you know, for a summary, usually we kind of take, like, what did we learn from these research articles? But I just want to go back to LaFrance and Tarbox because they, I think, had a really excellent summary as to what the state of multiple exemplar teaching, training, instruction is now, at least in 2019, when their article was published. And I think these articles kind of captured it, really, the idea that both of them can be effective. However, MEI studies have not all had the same amounts of replication as, uh, say, MET studies. However, both techniques can be useful, but for slightly different goals. So MEI may be more important. So in terms of if you're looking to research something with multiple exemplars, MEI might be the place to go. I think that's the more, there's less information on it. Mm-hmm. There's more that I think would speak towards the, the idea of generativity than you're going to get in MET, which is really more generalization. So, hey, MEI is a great place to be looking for chances to do more research. Maybe, but we also have not, we've seen two studies now with no results. So I think they might need to back it up. Well, it may be a matter of it's not right. going to work, yeah. Yeah. But you could be looking at, again, smaller chunks. You could right. be adding in other components. Maybe there's components that are missing right. to those studies. So, you know, you, you could look into it. But again, you, yeah, it might sadly come out too, unless you're talking about your basic operants. MEI is not going to go anywhere. Right. And it's not really going to be the explanation for where kind of untrained operant emergence mm-hmm. comes from. It's, it's certainly possible. But LaFrance and Tarbox don't want us to give up, so let's <laughs> let's, stay, they, they, let's do it for them, folks. 
So how much training with MEI is required, if ever, to get those generative verbal behaviors or uh, the generative verbal behavior? But if we could crack it, it's one of those things, if we could crack it, that might explain how we learn to learn more language. So if we could figure it out, it might be sort of that <laughs> Pandora's box that allows us to do everything we could ever want in terms of teaching verbal operants. But it also could go nowhere, in which case, hey, MET, pretty standard pattern, but we know it works because we've used it in, in as a field in a lot of different mm -hmm. situations. And we also still need both of them a little bit work on, like, what's the package? What's the package mm -hmm. treatment that you're going to tell someone about? Because I'm like, okay, so get all your exemplars together. Now we got to categorize them. Now we got to change up the relevant stimuli, but only the stimuli that we think is really relevant in terms of being differentiated. Then we got to get different set. It's like you lost me at get all the exemplars. I'm not doing that. That's it's that's a lot. It's when am I going to do all that? It's, it's a lot to put together. So like video, video modeling. Once you get it together, it's great, but getting it together is really hard. So, some recommendations from LaFrance and Tarbox. That idea of bidirectional naming seems to be a behavioral cusp for novel verbal behavior. So, that's where MEI might come into play. But if you want to use MEI, it is going to be helpful, potentially helpful, for training multiple operands that use the same stimuli. So, if you're trying to train functional interdependence between your speaker and listener repertoires or between some of the basic verbal operands, MEI is what you want to go to, that kind of rapid switching between your trials. If your goal is to teach some form of stimulus or response generalization in which all the responses have the same function, MET is where you want to go. So if you're just saying, I've taught all, I've taught this great repertoire to a student, the skill has not generalized, MET is, that's the basket you want to put your eggs in. They also say, please, please use your terms precisely and not interchangeably because the generativity you expect to see is going to vary. So if you say used MEI when you were trying to get stimulus and response generalization, that is not actually what you would get. You would be getting, you'd be showing some sort of, you know, functional interdependence between operands, or you would see emergence of new operands. So, something to keep in mind. So, hey, guess what? They're two different things. For me, I love a good MET. I love a good general case analysis. I kind of wish I had the time to just sit down and think about all the things that need to be taught and just made like the big book of tables of multiple exemplar training stimuli and conditions. I think that would be a super awesome reference book. Am I going to do that? That would be nice. I'm you should do that. I should, but I, I don't know if I will. You but have this whole summer, Rob. Get the on whole, Yeah, the whole summer. Any other final thoughts? I think LaFrance and Tarbox really, once I read that, I was like, well, I don't have anything better to say than them. So I will just refer to their great article with an odd title, but a great article. No, I don't have anything specific to add, except don't be intimidated by some of these articles here. If you're like, whoa, I didn't know it entailed all of that, you can approach this from a simple perspective, depending on what you're looking to teach. It's not always related to verbal behavior either. You can teach lots of different things with multiple exemplars. And you would use this when your ultimate goal is to teach and plan for generalization. So, if your goal is that you want to see the behavior displayed in the generalized educational setting and you expect that there would be a lot of different ways that the discriminative stimuli might present in order for you to then see the response you're looking for, MET might be a good way to go. Mm -hmm. And you should always be testing in that generalized setting to determine if what you've been working on is actually successful. So that's a really important key end step. Yeah. And head back, go back to the Siva Raman article for just a great example of empathy skills, multiple exemplars. I don't know how I'm going to come up with that. But when you read it, you're like, oh, no, yeah, that's a, yeah. that's that's what it is. Those are great multiple exemplars. So, I mean, and, and just do it as an exercise. I would say just take take a skill that you're like, I don't know if this generalizes all the time and just break it down real quick. You know, you can go back to the general case analysis research if you want, but just give it a try. Like, don't don't expect it to be perfect right off the bat, but just try it out. I bet you'll find that when you look at your crazy table you say oh that wasn't as bad as i thought it was and then you can you know look at some of the other articles we've discussed or these articles to kind of fine tune your tables and, and make sure that they're going to you know give you the results you're looking for which is that generalization well that brings us to the end of our episode on multiple exemplars in teaching i want to thank certainly both of you for being here but also thank our listeners for being here and as a little present i'm going to give you the second of those secret code words and it is spiral, S-P-I-R-A-L, spiral. It's, you know, it's a circular pattern, sort of goes down a, a y-axis, I guess. You have a spirograph. I guess you don't need that. There's a creepy horror manga about spirals. Don't read it if you're easily scared because it's kind of gross, too. Spiral. All right. 
And hey, you know what? In addition to Secret Code Words, we'd really love it if you did a little something for us. Now would be if you reviewed and subscribed to our show. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. A lot of other places you can find us. We're on all the socials as ABA Inside Track. You can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, to find links to all of the articles that we discussed, as well as to purchase CEs or find old episodes that we've done in the past. We have over 200 episodes. If you want to get even more ABA Inside content, track content, you can also subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where for just $5 a month, you can get access to quarterly videos that we do, live episodes. You can vote on book club choices. You can vote on live episodes, get some free CEs as well as some discounts for CEs. And if you want access to our extra long book club podcast that we do once a season, you can subscribe at our premium $10 level. That will get you access to all of the book clubs we've done, two CEs just for being our friend. And then, you know, like listening to the episode too. Our most recent one was the nurture effect where we talked about preventative care at the individual and societal level. We're going to be having a new book club out. By the time this comes out, you should be able to see what the vote was on. It was on books related to social justice, and that'll be coming out in August. Again, that's patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. And if you just want to email us with thoughts for episode ideas or with questions, you can do that at ABA Inside Track at gmail.com. Final big, big thanks go to Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for our interstitial music, and Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his amazing editing work. We'll be back next week with another full-length episode, but until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye! Bye.